Uh, welcome uh, everyone to this week ATI seminar series where we have an uh, eminent uh, nephrologist uh, presenting today, uh, Dr. Prayra, that I will introduce later. I will first start with the land acknowledgement. Uh, the University, University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located in on Treaty 6 territory and uh, we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nation, Métis, Inuit, and all First Nation people of Canada, uh, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community and cultures. We also uh, thank the uh, Paladin for their support of the ATI seminar series, including this one today. So our speaker today is Dr. Andre Pereira, who is a nephrologist uh, originally from Brazil. Uh, he went to medical school there and uh, went on to specialize in nephrology and kidney transplantation. He has also undertaken an, an extensive academic training, uh, but in Brazil and here in Canada, uh, he had his master's degree and PhD uh, over there in uh, molecular medicine. Uh, he also had an opportunity to work uh, with Professor Halloran, uh, 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 who is uh, a leading global transplant uh, nephrologist and researcher uh, here in Edmonton from two, 2012 to 20, 2013. And he has spent most of his life working successfully coordinating and uh, running kidney transplant services in three different states in his home country of Brazil. Um, Andre is a member of uh, multiple professional organizations, uh, a big list here. I will mention a few, including the Bra Brazilian Association of Organ Transplantation, Brazilian Society of uh, Nephrology as well, and uh, International Society of Nephrology. He has been a reviewer for uh, multiple medical journals, uh, including nephrology. And he's, he has been a practicing uh, nephrologist over in his health con uh, home country of Brazil. And uh, he is clearly interested in clinical research targeted to improving the care and outcomes of uh, patients, uh, kidney patients, and particularly uh, in the transplant world. So, not surprising, the title of his presentation today is about challenges of disease kidney donation in Brazil, uh, perspective of nephrologists and uh, possible uh, solution. Uh, you are very welcome today and uh, I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Pereira uh, for his talk. Thank you very everyone for opportunity to be here and to make this presentation. I'm uh, so I'm a Brazilian nephrologist. I'm not a nephrologist here in Canada, and um, I won't show my experience there. And some things that we uh, I think all nephrologists uh, struggle about kidney transplant. Uh, <clears throat> I do not have any conflict of interest, and I do not discuss do not discuss any off label use of drug device. This in during this presentation. Uh, I hope uh, I will show you guys why to insist on increasing deceased donors, the barriers for deceased organ donations, and possible solutions for getting more deceased donors. <clears throat> um, as Dr. Bello uh, very fast explained, I in Brazil it's a, a, I work in these three different states in Brazil. Brazil, it's a huge country with two, two, uh, 200 million of people and 8 million kilo, kilometers square. <clears throat> and uh, really be huge and uh, with different uh, environments. The, almost the first 10 years of my life, I work in this state, Minas Gerais, the city of Belo Horizonte. With the, the, the this is a donor's number of 11 donors per meter of population. After that, 
And during this time, I came here and stayed one year with Dr. Hall Haller, who uh, I am very grateful for his for the opportunity to come. And I stay after after that, I stay for more two years in uh, the north of Brazil. I did it after I organized the kidney transplant receivers here in Belo Horizonte. We started with five, 15 kidney transplant per year. And when I left the state and went to the north, we were doing 80 kidney transplant per year. One, uh, around one third of the kidney transplant were from living donors. And here in the north, it was a really different challenge because uh, the number of deceased donors was only three donors per million of population. And it's a different place because uh, it was really the only transplant center in all this dark area that you can see here, where it's the, really the Amazon forest. And um, when I went there, we, I restart the service. It was uh, a challenge because uh, they don't have uh, hemodialysis for all the patients, so the patients had to stay in the had to stay on dialysis. Had to, to stay, sorry, in the line waiting for the opportunity to do to do hemodialysis. And uh, a lot of time I was. Take up, making the evaluation of the potential recipient. And when he gets the kidney transplant, he wasn't in dialysis yet, although he had all the, the characteristics to go to dialysis when I did the first evaluation. So it was really hard. It was nice and, and interesting because of the challenge. And um, when I left the, the state, we were doing we were doing 50 one, I think, kidney transplant per year. What's interesting. And during this time, because of, of this uh, small uh, number of deceased donors, I had to use this is uh, grafts from all around the country. And sometimes the code scheme at time was really huge. And the person said, call and say, explain they have a, a graph that will not be used on that state. Mainly from the south, when they have this huge number of this is a donor, we just say, no, please send. I'll, I'll double check if we can use it on the back table. So that's what we. That's what we. That's what happened. And uh, after that, I went to the. After that, I went to the to the south, and it was a really totally different challenge because we had high number of this is a donors. 40 donors per million of population in this state of Santa Catarina. And uh, they already had, already had uh, transplant centers. In the state, they had, when I was there, about four transplant centers. And I went there to do the, I went there to do the, uh, I went there, there uh, to use the graphs that were not being used by, that were not being used by the, uh, the transplant centers there. And um, it was very nice, uh, very nice experience as well. I will explain more about that. The number of kidney transplants in, in Brazil, they are not small, as you can see here on 2000. 20, we reach, we reach 2019 before pandemic, we reach almost around 6,000 kidney transplant. And we reduced it because, unfortunately, because of pandemic, although the other organs didn't do so much. And um, <clears throat> now we are trying to recover and increase the number, right? But because of all the hospital, hospitals and the facilities, uh, were changed because of the pandemic. Now we are trying to re recover it again. Here is the uh, annual, annual projection of uh, kidney transplant for 20, 2022. And here are the numbers on 2022, just of the first semester. And uh, some particularities in Brazil, it's interesting to know. So although we do all these kidney transplants, um, 
the world's largest kidney transplant center is in Sao Paulo. The name is Kidney Hospital. And they do around 1,000 kidney transplant a year for pandemic. Now I think they are, you do around six, 800, 800 prob probably. And uh, I think the second in the world is about, about 400, 400 kidney transplant per year. And so and, um, some of you probably know Dr. Ario Tedesco and Dr. Medina who coordinated the hospital. It's a really interesting place to work, to know about all the challenge in the process of kidney transplant. Some states, unfortunately, we are 20, 27 states, 24, 27 states, and three of four states don't do transplants, unfortunately. And there are no oral CMV prophylaxis, just Two states, I think, have it, but small states with very small number of kidney transplants. So we have to struggle with CMV. It's not easy. Uh, the public sy system, fortunately, pays for transplant procedures anymore, immunosuppressants for every patient for all lifelong. Good for them, for us. The hypertermic perfusion machines are available only in some states. One or two states have it. and I. And again, just states that don't do so much transplants, kidney transplants. And we don't have molecular microscope. We don't have nanostring, be hot, cell-free DNA, urine biomarker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We work with the things that most of people in the world, uh, I think, work. And we still do transplant. And uh, I think for transplant, uh, Brazil has immunosuppressants. We have AJ lay labs. You have kidney pathologists, surgeons, nephrologists. So the basic for kidney transplant we have. But Brazil does not have a number of effective diseased donors like all around the world. Um, maybe Spain, right? And, and yes, now they have a high number. And we, we don't have kidney pair donation program like here in Canada, unfortunately. But I think it could help uh, as well. And uh, Brazil, it's a country with a lot of countries inside. What I mean by that? Sao Paulo, I told you about Sao Paulo. This, these are the states, and these are the number. This, this, is, the, this is the number of uh, kidney transplants just in the first semester of this year. Sao Paulo, that, that state that I showed that do uh, around 1,000 from before pandemic, 1,000 kidney transplant just in one center. Uh, this first semester, they, do, they did uh, around uh, 700, right? And what I mean is that center is responsible for most of kidney transplant of the state. And they do disease and living donors and they do kidney transplant uh, with uh, recipients, not just of the states, with a lot of, from a lot of states that don't have uh, kidney transplants or just a small number. And, but Sao Paulo have a lot of, a lot of, um, I don't know, more than 20, 30 kidney transplant centers. But most of them are concentrated in this hospital. And uh, Minas Gerais at the state that I worked for 10, 15 years, 10 years, uh, uh, is the second largest kidney transplant state in the in the country. We do we live in Donna as well, and um, Santa Catarina is the less less uh, state where I work at with forty donors per million of population, and here you can see just a few, just a few living donors. Santa Catarina here, just six living donors within one hundred thirty four. Kidney transplants, still necessary, but just we don't use. And Amazon, the last when, when I was working uh, in the middle of the time, they are not doing kidney transplant anymore, unfortunately. And the, and the, Sao Paulo has the higher absolute number, right? Because it, the city, just the city that you have, the state and the city of Sao Paulo, just the city of Sao Paulo, it's around I think 30, 30 million people, and. Uh, 
Uh, but here, when you go to the CISA donors, Sao Paulo is here, a little lower than 20 donors per million population. And the state where I was working, close to 40 donors per million population. Pretty uh, uh, different. And all the different from the, the, in the, the country. Uh, Amazon is here, where I was working, just three dollars per million of population. I just want to show you to uh, explain the, the difference of the country, the, the difficulties. Uh, I will explain a little more the difficulties. And um, uh, even that, even that, uh, we are doing, we were doing 6,000. And it was uh, after pandemic reduced for, for around 4,000. And just one third of patients around the world, right? Not, not just Brazil, one third of patients can be transplanted, can be, can go to the waiting list. And the, oh, sorry, I don't know why they did it. And uh, so the number of patients on dialysis, it's like skyrocketing, right? All time. And uh, it's heartbreaking to see that these lines are not closed. And because of that, I, because of that, we have to use living donors, right? They know the way the patient is on dialysis. If, if uh, a loved one of anyone is on dialysis, want to help, want to make the donation. And um, the, for the nephrologist who work since the beginning of the process, when you make the evaluation, of the recipient and uh, living donors, you you can you work during the, the patient in hospital, just after the transplant or during the transplant, and make the follow up for years of the the recipient and the donor, right? It's um, it's not so simple to think about that. And when I started to work with kidney transplant. Uh, I started to follow the donors as well. And on then that time, 2013, 2003, sorry, 2003, 2004, our, um, the papers that we have usually were comparing just the, the survival of, of uh, the living donors with general population. On that time, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have um, a very, a very good papers for that. <clears throat> but I could see so with some years and uh, with just 20 donors, we did a follow up of seven years. And on that time, on that time, I didn't accept uh, a donor with, uh, hy with hypertension. And uh, after some years, they became with uh, hypertensive, hypertensive patients, half of them. So we, I got concerned about that. And uh, one of the fellows from the, uh, the hospital we were work, working came here to, came to Toronto to make this presentation. And it was the beginning of something on the back of my mind that there's something else that we should do. And this paper is very interesting. Less, I think the last two good, really good papers about living donors are this uh, from Join and Musa Ali, whom Join and 2014 and 25 years follow up, he have found 20, 24 deaths among almost 22,000 donors. And uh, then in the, among controls, the number was around 2,000 um, among 332,000 controls. So a, re a, a, a really a low number of deaths in controls comparing with the donors. And the risk of end-stage renal disease was higher in donors as well by this other paper in 15 years follow-up, follow-up of 15 years. And um, to take, today people don't die, right? They live a lot of years, you know, the Queen Elizabeth, it's almost than 100 and a lot of, at least in Brazil, I remember, I, I always have at least three or four patients on dialysis over than uh, 90 years old. So I, I don't think, I wasn't thinking about 15 or 25 years. I was thinking about, about uh, 
40 and 50 years how is in the future and this i think this is the last the last uh, paper uh, comparing analyzing the the risk of end stage end stage renal disease in donors versus the the non non donors and the risk were were uh, was between 3 and 5 times after that it's interesting because the papers uh, always or analyzing the risk of the donor, just the risk of the donors, or, or analyzing which donor has the lower risk comparing to the other one, others, to the others potential donors to be a donor. And uh, when you analyze and make an evaluation of these patients, uh, in this paper of Sagavi, it's very interesting about that because it's, it's very clear for you when you know that this candidate, a candidate, it's okay to make the donation, right? They have lower risk to, have, to go to the dialysis, to have some problem. You know that this candidate is really bad, right? You, you, you will not accept him to be a donor, but you always have some in the lingo. You always have some that, oh, I don't know, maybe just he had uh, a kidney stones, but just one time, just two times, I don't know if, what is kidney stone or not? And um, it's uh, it always there is always something tricky. And and uh, the fact is, <clears throat> the risk in donors is higher than in healthy non-donors, but lower than in general population. And we work with it. And this point of analyzing. The, the make an evaluation of the living donors and wanting the best for the recipient uh, was very well uh, explained on this paper. And uh, when he found that in the research with survey of survey of, of physicians making the evaluation of potential donors, living donors, he found that 20% of responders answered correctly regarding relationship be between absolute and relative risk for rare outcomes. What it means with that? Um, maybe the, the analysis is too strong to consider just one phrase, okay. But the point is there is the risk of not evaluating correctly the potential donors, even the risk of not giving the correct information for the potential donors because they believe us. They believe that the, the potential donor, living donor and the recipient, they believe us. So we, it, this, it's really important and tricky, this evaluation. And uh, um, although if my brother was in dialysis, I would make the donation of my kidney to him. I have no doubt about that. I wouldn't, even because in my state, the, the number is just 11 donor per million population. I wouldn't, I, I, I love him, I love my family, I would make this donation. However, I think we need higher efforts to increase the use of deceased donors. Uh, I tried to find some, some source, some information here from Canada, some in, in this study, and I, I Probably there are better uh, papers in study, but I found these in the website and uh, showing some barriers for donation. This is the donors. And uh, considering nine points, uh, at least five of them, these this, this points are difficulties before the notification or really in the start of the notification of this is a donor. Considering that we have to increase the number of deceased donors, right? The first step looks like the most important. So, if we um, imagine the decision organ donation process with all these steps, in the last step between the organ removal and the organ transplant, one problem can be the long code ischemia time when you have to cross the organ from the west to the east of Canada, I can imagine. And in Brazil is a huge, huge country as well. And sometimes the logistic, the flights and everything. And misallocation, it's pretty rare, but can happen. 
uh, it happened to me in Brazil one time. We were because so many donors. A box came. We saw the we double check the name. Oh, oh, oh! It's not this donor. The the the, the other donor went to the other city. We have to change the 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 organ. So and so because of that, longer post chemia time. But we still did the transplant. And maybe it could be like the limit, and we wouldn't do the transplant. So misallocation can be a problem. A surgical lesion. Asian, a lot of time fellows go to do there. And for me, even a very good surgeon can have a, a lesion in the, make a lesion in the, in the kidney or in the ureter and, or organ lesion. Many in the moment of the implantation of the organ and you're cleaning, you find a tumor or something. And before then, if, if, after you have the effective donor and, and before the organ, really organ removal, you can have the you can find an infection in the donor, cardiac arrest, yeah, right? He's unstable. No, no surgeon for organ removal. They are all working on something else. No recipient, really rare, but it's possible. And transportation logistics. We don't have okay, we, we don't have how to take this organ from where we are we are moving it. And uh, after the start of the protocol. And before the effective donor, after they start our protocol of uh, brain death or cardiovascular death, uh, we can have a, a, refusal, a refusal from the, the patient or family or cardiac arrest or alter tests. I, I say that the, we start the protocol after the, after the family allowed the transplant because uh, at least in Brazil, we do it for all disease donors, for all uh, patients. So if, if they have brain death, we turn off the machines. In two. Well, that's it. And <clears throat> in this step, after this, before the start of protocol, we can have problem about the capacity, higher priority patients and cardiac arrest uh, as well, right? They don't have time. And the first step here, is the capacity of, of, uh, of the hospital can be a problem. And the doctor has to deal with higher priority patients. So he will not notificate this uh, uh, potential donor, the, the physician or the, the nurse, will not do it. But okay, we have this problem, but what do they, the difference? These are the states that I told you that they are doing four, around 40 don they have 40 donor, uh, this is a donor of per million of population. What's the difference? What did they do? Uh, a doctor, Dr. Joel de Andrade, it's uh, from Santa Catarina. He, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he went to Spain, he came from Spain and uh, brought the knowledge of the Spain model and implemented did it in Santa Catarina, and after it was replicated for for Paraná. Okay, um, he is just no, he is a São Paulo, right? This is the the, the two, two two states, this and this, and São Paulo here with a, a large absolute number, and Minas Gerais a little here close. But what's the difference of these one these states? Um. As I told you, it wasn't just from yesterday for today. It's a long run. They, they, in around 2004, they start to make the, they apply this system and it goes increasing in the, the number of effective, this is a donor, this is Santa Catarina. And here's the number of Brazil that, think, okay, it increased from around seven to 15 or 18 before pandemic. But not like that. You could do more. What the, what they did about the work with education and government investment on organ decision, uh, organ donation uh, organizations, and they keep with uh, doing uh, continuing education for the, the members, and um, usually they have. Uh, Two state meeting per year with 150 attendants and 10 to 12 regional meetings per year. So education 
education, 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 that's what they did. And payment for members, because in other states, like Minas Gerais, like in, I was in the Amazon, it's like an extra job for the nurse, an extra job for the, 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 for the a physician, but they don't get any amount more because of that. So it, it has to be considered a way of life and people work with that and with education. This is Santa Catarina. This is the, the city that I was living in, Itajaí. And we have 32 cities with 64 donor hospitals and just four kidney transplant centers, I think three or four, Joinville, Blumenau, no, I think it's five. five. Joinville, Blumenau, Itajaí, Florianópolis, uh, Criciúma, six, and uh, Chapecó. So Catarina is a 7 million people uh, state. Alberta is 4.2 million, just to compare. Uh, but the density is pretty different, right? Just we have 76 people per kilometer square in the state, and Alberta it's just mountains. So uh, we have the population is concentrated, and it's a little easier to work with it. And this paper of Dr. Joel de Andrade, he did this, the, he explained all the, the process to make the implementation of this model with a lot of steps. And uh, with the, the phase one, two, three, what's the big difference that happened with that was he reduced the number of family refusals Right, motivation interviewing or a lot of, a lot of uh, knowledge about this interview. No big difference about the contraindication of donations. Reduce the car cardiac arrest. So he take, took care of the donor in a better way or have more people for them. Uh, reduce the number of other loss and the number of uh, potential donors that became effective donors increase it as well. So a lot of different things that together were really important to make this increase. Okay, but this is a long-term, right? It's a long-term process. What else can be done with you, you think in uh, planning of a short term? That's uh, what can we do to treat the anxiety of the physician, the nephrologist who's taking care of the recipient. It's crazy with this, this situation. I think one thing on my mind, it's uh, use more hypothermic uh, diffusion machines. So we can use more in Brazil. We have just one or two states and maybe we can use more organs from around the, the country. And one idea that I start to do when I want to show for you guys here is about the uh, app for increasing this donation. I start to develop it with a company in the nonprofit company in, in Amazon. And, but I stopped when I went to the South because it doesn't make sense to work with that in a state with 40 donor per million of population where I was swimming in, inside a lot of organs because people didn't want to use this work and I had them to use. <clears throat> and the point was work here in the, in the beginning. What could you do to increase the number of, of the, uh, in the, the identification of potential donors? What could we do? Um, I was in Manaus, right, at that time. And in Manaus, uh, <clears throat> the health system is really complicated. And uh, there, for sure, the doctor has a lot of patients to take care. A lot of patients uh, uh, in small, small uh, clinic needing a bed in the ICU and needing to, uh, uh, needing to be treated. So we had to help him. We had to help him or her. Um, and the idea of this app, it's a short thing, short term thing. I don't think this, this is a big thing to change, but it's, I think it's one thing else, right? The idea was that the, the health worker 
not the physician, can be the physician, the nurse, but any health worker attending the patient would have um, uh, in his cell phone um, uh, application where he can communicate the, the, the organization team and tell them, oh, here we have a patient, but without explaining what the name, the, the date of birth or any identification of patient, just characteristics. Oh, you have, I think we have here a potential donor. You have it, 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 you're just clicking something, but pretty fast, less than one minute clicking. And the, the, the team here would uh, have this information. And accordingly with the information that he had, he could be in touch with this hospital that could be in city one, two, or three, depends, or maybe in the same city and send our organ donation staff okay, to help, to help because the, the, they don't have hands to do everything. They need people to help. And the team would have this, this is the website view, uh, the name S Life, the name that we created that time, and 2015, it's just confirmed again, it's confirmed again. This, it doesn't own to any company. This one name that we create any time. Uh, and um, uh, this app is not working. We just started and to, this was just an idea. And I even make the presentation in a conference in Brazil about that, but it's not working. It doesn't own to any company. It's an idea to be developed. I think it's, it's a, that's the point. And so this, the, the team would, would be able to make the registration of the, the user, verifying his credentials as a nurse, as a, a health, any kind of health worker that would be that uh, a health worker that would have, that was allowed to have access for the file of the, the patient. And he would control the, the number of notification, number of hospitals, number of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, hospitals, uh, health workers, and possible potential donors. And the user uh, would have the, 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 for sure the, the way to make the login and password to know the number of the patients that he already sent some notifications for the, for the team and the uh, number of hospital that it was, where, where, were, where was his, where were his patients. And the way to make this notification, not notification, right? The disinformation for the team had to be very fast, like just, just uh, clicking on something or dropping down something very fast, less than one minute, whoop, that's on, I send and I come back to work. And the team can know that. Okay, it's not a simple thing. That's one thing else that came on my mind. And actually that's, uh, I have been talking with some colleagues here and um, I still think that the best model is to do like a US or Spanish model and increase to have a long-term education or long-term uh, long long -term implementation of a model. But this app can be a short-term solution you to have. It will help a little bit, but you have some challenges for sure. Ethical analysis, it's necessary. And the important thing is that we don't have patient direct identification. The file access has to be done only by professional attending the patient. It, to create it, okay, it's not developed. Five years ago, we started, but didn't finish it, stop it and we can create it in Alberta, and maybe with a postdoc, maybe with the help of the University of Alberta or Calgary, but maybe by Alberta Health Service, maybe by a private company. I put less option here because on my mind, in Brazilian mind, we always think that everything has in transplant has to be done by a, a, in a non-profit way to, to don't have ethical problems about that. And the opportunities about that is increase the number of diseased donors, even one point to point, but you will take someone out of dialysis, increase the number of transplants, and less pressure of potential living donors. 
like like I think I told in the beginning, where I was making the evaluation of the couple in, in Santa Catarina, we, we had potential living donors, but I talked with them and I explained to the, for the recipient. Okay, we have, uh, we have this potential donor, but give some months and maybe, and maybe it's not necessary for the, uh, to use these living donors. And that's what happened. We did there around during these years, we, just starting, right? So um, 60 kidney transplants, 70 kidney transplants in the total, and no one, no one living donor transplant. Because it was pretty fast to get this, this is a donors. So, but some place it's necessary, these living donors. So I don't, I'm not saying repeating, I have to repeat, repeat here. I'm not saying that using living donors is wrong, just to have less, less pressure on them if we use higher efforts to increase the season donors. Uh, and so in summary, I, have, I think we have to insist on increasing the season donors and because the living donor kidney transplant are not harmless. Notification of potential donors seems to be the main step to be worked on. Spanish model is working well in Brazil and had a good impact in the last 20 years where it was adequately applied. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for, to, for doing this presentation. I'm Brazilian, but I'm living here in Canada since last year and struggling to find a way to work, study, doing what else and here. And um, <clears throat> I have to say thanks again for Dr. Joel de Andrade, who is the physician in his uh, ICU in Santa Catarina and for uh, our, who sent me some slides and allowed me to use this information before, but uh, for the opportunity to do this presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Pereira, for presenting this uh, interesting data. Uh, we have uh, some time, about 10, 15 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, and I think I can start. This is, the data is quite uh, intriguing to see uh, overall, I think uh, when we put it on the scale, on a global scale, uh, Brazil has really done well. I'm also aware of the data of the Global Clinic Health Atlas for the International Society of uh, Nephrology that this country is among the top 10 yeah. in terms of uh, absolute number of uh, kidney transplantation being done annually, uh, second only to the United States and uh, the only middle income country also to be in those top 10, but Canada is in the, in the top 10 as well. But mm -hmm. one factor by population still is doing very well, about 26, 27 in the world uh, ranking. But the, in, the intriguing part is that you mentioned the kidney transplantation process. I mean, the surgeries, you know, everything there and medications are all covered by public system. Yes. Right. But there's still this significant within country variation. For example, I see the data between the north, the, the, the southeastern part of the country, some region doing much, much better than the others. Why is that so? Are these cultural factors or uh, something to do with the healthcare structure organization? Same country, same funding, same national policy and framework? I think it's politician about uh, economic things of the, the 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 state, but I think it's more related for the government of each state. This is the big point that makes the difference. And when I was in the north, <clears throat> I think this is an example. When I was in the north, uh, with low, it's. It was really uh, complicated because we don't, we still don't have enough hemodialysis spot for all patients. It was really necessary, and when I was there, we were doing transplant, but um, I had to leave, and I went to the south, and when I left, they stopped. So there's there's something related about the uh, the force from the government. This is the main point of the difference. Right, okay, I see. Any, great, any question from the audience? And 
I see victim also from ID. So I know I'm from Nigeria, you know, Africa, one of the challenge to access or sustainability of kidney transplant program uh, will be infections, you know, rates around the pre operative period, you know, many transplants successfully, you know, different fatal infect sepsis and uh, complicating terms, uh, often leading to rejection and also long term, two, three years down the line, there are risks of uh, chronic infections. In particular, we see uh, tuberculosis, uh, a big mm -hmm. program in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, mm -hmm. limiting survival of the organ itself and the survival of the individual transplant recipient. Is that an mm -hmm. issue? Because Brazil also is uh, tropical, like Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> yeah, we have a lot of tuberculosis. Yeah, we have a lot of tuberculosis, okay. a lot of Chagas, Chagas disease, but we learn to live with this, uh, with this disease and we do transplant with the Chagas, donors with Chagas disease, even then. Some states, some states do, some states don't. Uh, because depending on how aggressive you are to, if you have this is a donors or not. Like in the South, where I start in the last years, uh, people were really picking cherries and choosing really very good donors. But when I was in the North, I was taking almost everything, but it was more challenging, more efforts, more job. And uh, I think this is, this is the, the, the but Bello, just coming back here because it's it's interesting question. What, why the difference between among all these these states? Because in the south, in the south of Brazil, like uh, Sao Paulo, even Sao Paulo, right? Twenty donors per million of population. It's a high number, but the state is huge, right? You made a city with thirty million people. Uh, they should do more kidney transplant, I think still, and they have a higher uh, economic situation. It's a rich state, but it doesn't work so well because you have some uh, situations in the government or something that they cannot make the center work. In Santa Catarina, it worked because of this, this physician. I think he's the biggest responsible for that. 10 years ago to any really decide, no, I want to do, I want to, to work more than I should. I want to spend my life uh, increasing, making a model to increase the number of the deceased donors. And so he increases the number of deceased donors and consequently the number of centers. So I think it's a lot of facts. It's not one thing. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Anyone from the audience? So have the time. <laughs> we have so all right, so what, what about immunosuppression? Because Brazilian model is, is really great. Many tend to learn, particularly for developing countries of the world. Uh, how is that? Is it funded like a standard induction therapy as we use here in Canada, or and, and including even the maintenance uh, therapy for patient? Is that covered yes. all uh, standard as we do here, or maybe they are trying cheaper alternatives? We do. For example, we do. use of is uh, instead of MMBL, cyclos, fraud, and test of you know, things like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, we use, uh, this is uh, some, some things. Uh, we use uh, for induction, it's pretty common, uh, considering all the center to use thymoglobulin. Yeah. Some of them can use Simulect, but most of them can use thymoglobulin. Uh, <clears throat> because we don't have we, because we don't have this oral uh, prophylaxis for CMV, which is complicated, mm. uh, we use tacrolimus and uh, mTOR inhibitors together yeah. because it, it, it really reduced uh, the, the incidence. Um, and uh, but most of the the most of the centers use uh, tacrolimus and mycophenolate. Yeah. So, some centers, in the main, mainly in the north east, are using no corticoids. And uh, <clears throat> during, but the in hospital medication, like 
different like uh, rituximab or other things. We have some states in Sao Paulo, Dr. Maria Cristina, she is very, I think the most known person there about using this highly sensitized patients and using brutizomib, everything, but it's really unique place where you have more money from the government. Like Canada, you have a lot of problems mm -hmm. with different laws. Sometimes in some, in some studies, you can have valgociclovir, you can have more immunosuppressants. Right. Suppress. <laughs> but the basic, for all lifelong, you will have for free immunosuppressant. So it's it's a it's a, a different unique country about the the health system, but we don't have everything. So uh, I think maybe a nice I can consider like in other countries about health system as well. Well, uh, that's really great, and uh, Dr. Pereira, thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge, sharing your uh, experience, and most importantly, this. Uh, uh, intriguing, a very interesting model of uh, kidney transplantation of uh, Brazil, which uh, many countries around the world, particularly the low-income nation in Africa and Asia, has a lot to to, to learn from. And uh, thank you very much for sparing your time to share the information with all of us. That's great uh, presentation. Thank you.